inside the navel ca nasal cavity, you notice uh, we have these folds here, or what's referred to as the nasal concha. Now, what these folds do is they slow down the air. So when the air comes in, it begins to hit those folds or those concha and swirl, or what we would call eddy. Now, there's a few different reasons why we want to slow the air down. First of all, the lungs themselves are really sensitive. So what the lungs are made out of is a tissue that is super, super thin. So if you could think of tissue paper and then make the tissue paper 10,000 times thinner, that's what you're looking at for the thickness of the lung material. So we can't allow too much dirt and particles to get in through the nose and then down into the lungs because it would, over time, destroy them. So by slowing the Of mercury. This is how we measure. 
measure blood pressure. And it is such a high pressure inside these capillaries that what it does is it actually will push water out of the capillary all day long and allow us to actually put the water into the tissues. Now that's really very important because some of this water is then going to make its way into the capillaries that parallel our blood capillaries. These are lymphatic capillaries. Now, all day long, our blood capillaries are constantly pushing water out. And that's the way it's supposed to be. And along with that water, we'll push out things like out of the blood and that water gets into the tissues and then our lymphatic capillaries have these little valves that as the water pushes on them that water will then enter into the lymphatic system through these open valves which then also brings bacteria, viruses even things like cancer cells into the lymphatic system then flows to the closest lymph node. And lymph nodes have all kinds of uh, lymphatic cells in them, like T cells and B cells, that help to kill these bacteria, viruses, even macrophage that eat up cancer cells. Now, one of the problems, though, is this blood pressure is so high that it could potentially push all the water out of our blood in a 24-hour period. Now, of course, that's really bad. You push all the water out, blood pressure goes down, you go into what we call hypovolemic shock, and you die. And so there has to be a way that once some of that water gets pushed out, it ends up coming back in. Now, the way that that happens is that all the time in our blood, in a healthy person, we have a protein stays in here called albumin. Albumin has a super high attraction for water. Wherever albumin is, water is going to be attracted to it. So even though the blood pressure is pushing all of the water out, albumin pulls the majority of the water back in. Now, what would happen if, let's say, the blood for a while and blood pressure went up, what would happen to the water? The higher the blood pressure, what happens to the water? It gets pushed out more. So you find with your patients who have really high blood pressure, they also have a lot of water in their tissues, or what we would call edema. And so this is why you see problems in the patients. Think about this. Let's say that we have a patient who uh, their left, their left ventricle is failing. Maybe they got, maybe they got a disease called cytomegalovirus or CMV and this virus gets into the cardiac muscle, kills off the cardiac muscle over time. So now their left ventricle is failing. Where does the pressure go up next? Because the heart can't pump all the blood out. Left. Where does the pressure go up next? The heart cannot pump the blood out of the aorta, so follow it backwards. The pressure goes up in the pulmonary system, right? The pressure goes up in the lungs. Because remember how it goes, okay? Right atrium, right ventricle, out to the lungs. Then to the left atrium, left ventricle. So if your left ventricle isn't working, it backs up into the left atrium. And then it backs up into the lungs. Now, if it keeps on failing, where does it back up next? Where does it back up next?
next. Where's the blood coming from that goes into the lungs? The right ventricle. So it's going to back up into the right ventricle. Then where does it back up? Into the right atrium. So over time, what will happen is you'll get so much blood in the right ventricle, it'll be overwhelmed and it will fail. So when the left ventricle fails, eventually the right ventricle fails. And we call that decompensated heart failure. Now, if the right ventricle fails and it backs up into the right atrium, after the right atrium, where does it go? Cartilage, you use skeletal muscle. 
though you never think about it anymore, you had to learn how to move that cartilage as a kid. And so as you learned how to talk, you were figuring out how to move that back and forth in order to make certain sounds. And now it's just totally reflexive. Uh, some people who are like in car accidents, things like that, they may have to relearn this reflex. So they have to go through the whole process of learning how to control their vocal cords again. Now, looking, oh, I want to tell you one more thing about this. Uh, the thyroid cartilage is like the vocal cords in one thing. The thyroid cartilage and the vocal cords are sensitive to levels of testosterone. So the higher the levels of testosterone are, the more the thyroid cartilage, the more the vocal cords grow. So for instance, in a young man, when he's starting to go through puberty and his testosterone levels start to rise, both the thyroid cartilage and the vocal cords are growing. Now the vocal cords get thicker, and the thicker the vocal cords, the deeper the person's voice. But the thyroid cartilage, also their Adam's apple, grows larger. Now what it does is it pulls on those vocal cords. So if they get a little bit of a growth spurt, it will pull those vocal cords and then they get a little twang that goes on all of a sudden, you know, as their voice is um, being used. So this is just a picture of actual vocal cords right here. So you can see those right here. Now, if you use your vocal cords a lot. Uh, what you're doing is you're exhaling, and as you exhale, those vocal cords are vibrating, okay? And then they start to make a sound because of that vibration. Now, eventually, uh, people who sing a lot or talk a lot, their vocal cords can start to vibrate, and they can start to swell, and then they start hitting on each and what you can find is that with these people, they get these little nodules or bumps on their vocal cords. And those little nodules uh, are very painful. And they make their voice very scratchy. And uh, they have a really hard time talking. Now, there's two things you can do to get rid of those nodules. One simply is just shut up. And I mean, you can't even whisper. You have to be completely quiet. Years ago, when I first started teaching, I got those nodules. And uh, the doctor's like, you're never going to get rid of them unless you just are quiet. And luckily, it was summer. So I was able to, like, shut up for the whole month of August. And I wrote everything down because no whispering, nothing. But some people just can't do that. And so what they end up doing is they end up having their vocal cords removed. Or not vocal cords, I'm sorry. <laughs> Nodules removed surgically. Now here's the problem. If you even slightly nick the edge of those vocal cords, you'll change the sound of somebody's voice. And it can be pretty dramatic. So one minute, you know, you could be a great opera singer, and the next minute you sound like Donald Duck. Literally. So really, your best bet is to try to not talk because that surgery can be very dangerous. Now, the air is then going to go from the larynx into the trachea. And uh, your trachea is surrounded by uh, cartilage. And the reason you've got this cartilage here is because you want to make sure that trachea stays open at all times. That would be a bummer if it closed because then you wouldn't be able to breathe. Okay, not a good idea. Now, notice this cartilage has this C shape right here. And at the back, it's held by a muscle. And behind the trachea sits your esophagus. So let's go back to this picture here. So here's your trachea. And behind the trachea is the esophagus. And then behind that is the spinal cord. Okay. 
and then it will hit if it's round that means if it's totally round the esophagus if it will contract it has had the problem whereas if it contract <coughs> it's a C shape it can also like adjust and expand expand yes. expand right okay so what she said is if we had an O right here when food goes down the esophagus it's going to have a hard time expanding because our esophagus, if we're not eating, is actually just flat. It's not open all the time like the trachea. It's flat. So when you put food in the esophagus, it opens it up. Okay? So where's the esophagus going to expand to? Okay, so let's look at this again. If your esophagus expands, it's got Now fall. 
water on tissue paper, see what happens. Now you've got this stuff that's even thinner than tissue paper, and you put mucus all over it. They're going to dissolve. Now, of course, in each of our lungs, we've got about 3 million alveoli. So you've got a lot of alveoli, but once you dissolve them, they don't grow back. So that's the big problem. And if you don't have alveoli, which we'll talk about in a little bit, you can't exchange gases. And when we lose our alveoli this way, this is a disease we call emphysema. Now, over time, if I keep exposing my cilia to this particulate matter, they will eventually die. And you know when somebody's cilia dies. So if you've ever heard those people, you know, for instance, that smoke a lot of cigarettes, and all of a sudden they have that uh, smoker's cough, where they're coughing so deep, they sound like they're hacking out a lung. That's because their cilia is now completely dead. And that mucus is getting deeper and deeper into their lungs, and they can't exchange gases. And you're going to hear from your emphysema patients that one of the things that they experience all day long is they feel like they're drowning. Imagine living a life where all the time you feel like you're drowning. It's got to be really miserable. Any questions so far? really interesting where uh, the mucus in this patient who is a long-term smoker you can see how it built up in their trachea and in their bronchi see how thick it is obviously it's very difficult to get air through that area by the way uh, I think I told you this but just in case uh, I'm teaching that forensic pathology class and this is a lot of the kind of stuff that we talk about the different diseases the that people end up dying, things like that. So if you're interested, it's still open. All right, now from the trachea, we're going to divide into the bronchi. Now, a word I want you to know. To bifurcate, okay? This is a typical term that's used in medicine. of epinephrine and norepinephrine. And their bronchioles will consume. 
watch this. Remember, 
they're still attached, but they're sliding with a fluid in between. That is kind of the consistency of egg whites. It's a little bit thicker. It's a little oily. It allows this sliding motion. Now, sometimes people will get a bacterial or a viral infection in the cells that make this pleural fluid, and it dries up. And then those membranes glide over each other without that fluid there and starts to create a friction. And that friction gets hot and it's very painful. And this is what they call what? What do they call this disease? Never heard of it before. Okay, so here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna look up the name of this disease where we don't make this pleural fluid anymore. And when we take our exam on Monday, you're gonna put the name on your Scantron and I'll give you two extra credit points for it. So what's the name of the disease where the pleural or the serous fluid dries up due to infection? And then the person gets a lot of pain from this every time they inhale or exhale, those membranes slide over each other, create this friction and this pain. Okay. Okay, so now when this fetus is born, it's going to take its first breath and that's going to blow the lungs up like a balloon. So this caved in chest is going to be pushed out. And so the lungs are still attached to the thoracic cage all the way around the body. The lungs are attached. Take like a scalpel and put it through in between somebody's ribs, directly underneath of the ribs would be the pleural membranes. And then, of course, directly under that is the lung tissue itself. And that, of course, is a problem because these pleural membranes are what are helping to keep the lungs open so that every time the chest moves with our respiratory muscles, it expands or contracts the lung tissue with every movement. So what happens, let's say, you have a patient who has pneumonia, and this patient is coughing really hard, and they cough so hard that they actually rip part of their pleural membrane off the wall of the thoracic cage. Now what happens? Well, they've ripped the membrane off. Yes, the fluid leaks. What else happens? What happens to the lungs? They deflate. It collapses. Because the only thing that's holding the lung open is the fact that the pleural membranes are attached to the lung and the thoracic cage. If you tear those membranes, that lung and that's what we call a collapsed lung. Okay. Now, the good thing, looking at the lungs, you know we've got lobes to the lungs. But what you can't see unless you're looking at it with a microscope is that there are segments to the lungs also. <coughs> now, each lung has about 23, 24 segments. And what that means is there's small parts of the lungs are separated and independent of each other with their own pleural membrane holding them to the thoracic wall. So if I cough and I just tear a little bit of the pleural membrane, what I will do is only collapse that one segment, a small segment of the lung instead of the whole thing. So that's really nice. No. No, so what you have to do is you actually have to go in and usually you go out through the exterior with a tube. And you can do it through the side depending on where it collapses. You go through the exterior with a tube. You blow that lung back up and the pleural membranes will just stick right to the wall. And then you just patch the hole on the outside. And so it's just like bumping up a balloon. It's really quite easy to fix. Any 
other questions? We were talking about how the infection of the brain is going to be more than it. What about when we feel like you're actually going to be more than it? Where's the pieces? How does that happen? That is usually infection, too. So you can have it one way or the other. Yeah. Yeah, they're both usually infection. Um, one very often is dried up because of viral. The other excess is usually bacterial. But it could happen either way. Now, by the way, notice how this uh, lung on the left side is not as big as the lung on the right. And that's because in the fetal stage of development, the heart develops first. And so the heart pushes to the left. Okay, remember the left axis deviation. And then the lung grows around the heart. So the left side, you don't have quite as much lung just simply because there's not as much space for it to grow. Okay, so now, coming off of the bronchioles, eventually you have these little tiny grape-like structures, you know, we call these the alveoli, okay? And the alveoli is where gas exchange with the blood is actually going to occur. And the alveoli have on the outside two important things, lots of capillaries. And then one other thing we're going to talk about a little later on, we also have a lot of elastic connective tissue or elastic fibers around these alveoli. And we'll talk about why that's important in a little bit. Okay, so we need to talk about exchange of gases between the alveoli and the capillaries, okay? Mm-hmm. 
this oily substance that covers over all the negative charges and prevents the water from binding. And we call that lowering the surface tension. And then the water just kind of balls up inside the alveoli. And when you exhale, the water comes out. Now, in the fetal stage of development, remember I told you the lungs develop pretty much last. And we don't actually have fully functioning type 2 cells that make surfactant until the eighth month of pregnancy. And that's because there's a hormone that isn't made until the eighth month of pregnancy. And that hormone stimulates type 2 cells. This hormone is cortisol. Now, question for you. Why do you think that it is beneficial for the fetus not to make cortisol until around the eighth month of pregnancy? Yeah. You don't want cortisol to go up in a fetus because it helps to keep the stress levels down, but also cortisol is a hormone that is catabolic. Now, what's catabolic mean? It destroys. It tears things down. And the last thing you want is a fetus that's trying to build itself up to have a hormone that tears it down. So now imagine you have this pregnant mom who's taking physiology in the summer. And her cortisol levels are really high because she's really stressed out. Cortisol is a steroid hormone. It's a fat hormone, which means it dissolves right across the placenta out of mom's bloodstream and directly into baby's bloodstream so that mom could be four, five, six months pregnant and her cortisol levels are really high and now so is the baby's. And instead of forming like it's supposed to because she's so stressed, it's also breaking things down. So the more stressed out you are while you're pregnant, the more harmful it is to the fetus. Pregnant moms should be home eating bonbons with their legs up and not doing anything else. <laughs> you remember that, gentlemen? And it's beneficial to make sure that she's home eating bonbons and not doing anything else, or you're going to have a stressed out, cranky, sick child for the next 50 years. So what's better, to make sure she's happy for nine months, or you're miserable for 50? Because that kid is going to be very sick, usually have an immune system problem, typically extremely cranky, and most likely have difficulties with uh, energy and uh, all kinds of problems. You don't want to have a kid with high cortisol levels. Not good. Oh, by the way, and pregnant women should never pump gas. Never. Never fill your gas tank up if you're pregnant there is a chemical in gasoline called benzene. And benzene, if you get it on you, dissolves right through your skin and it goes into your bloodstream and goes right to the fetus. And benzene causes leukemia in the unborn. So you want to stay away from gas stations. Don't even go there while you're pregnant. Stay away. It's bad. Even if, like, you filter? Doesn't matter. Causes leukemia. Why do you want to take the chance? I mean, we talk about, okay, you shouldn't drink alcohol when you're pregnant, but really, you shouldn't be pumping gas while you're pregnant. You stay away from gasoline. All kinds of things you shouldn't be doing while you're pregnant. Just being pampered and taken care of. What about those muscular exercise while they're pregnant? Like, like excessive, is that okay? Anything to excess is bad. So you don't want to eat bonbons to excess or exercise to excess. Because exercise 